Hi, welcome to our career exploration series. Today we're going to talk about women in technology. And I'm going to interview Nasrin Azari, who started out at the University of Michigan as a computer science major, spent several years at big corporate companies like IBM and Sony Ericsson, got two masters, one in computer science and one in business, and started her own technology company, Mobile Reach, which she's been president of for the past 10 years. Nasrin's going to talk about her whole career journey, but she's also going to touch on what it's like to be a woman in a traditionally male dominated field. And she's going to tell us about some of her biggest leadership lessons. So enjoy the interview. And here is Nasrin. Hi, welcome to the Aspire Career Exploration Series. I'm here today with Nasrin Azari, and she has had a career in technology with degrees in both computer science and then later business and several years in corporate at IBM and at Sony Ericsson and then you started your own company Mobile Reach and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So I'd like to start with maybe way back okay. when um, you first decided to go into technology as a career. Can you remember maybe what, what made that decision happen? Um, well, I do remember going to school, going to college, and not having any idea what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of, so in my, in high school, I did really well in math and science, and so I also really enjoyed a challenge, and mm -hmm. so when I went to Michigan, it's kind of funny, when I look back at my transcript, I really tried to take whatever, you know, the hardest classes I could take. Mm -hmm. You know, my freshman year, I went in there, and I just was like, well, what can I take? I, you know, um, I took some very difficult classes and I enjoyed the challenge and I decided to try computer science at that time, you know, 25 years ago, there wasn't computer science or programming in high school mm -hmm. or anything like that. So it was brand new to me and it required some of the classes that I had been really good at in high school. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to try the class. It was a massive class, um, at the university of Michigan. It was like three, 400 people in this class. Mm -hmm. And it was considered one of those weed out classes where they would push you really hard. The assignments were really difficult and I just excelled at it. So mm -hmm. this was probably my sophomore year, I think in college. And, um, I, I just loved it. I just really, really enjoyed mm -hmm. programming itself. So mm -hmm. computer science, I kind of fell in love with in college and then really it seemed like a great a great field it, it was new as it, it was exciting mm -hmm. it seemed like there was a lot of opportunity and it was cool and it was Excellent. really fun wow how fun how yeah. fun to do that to actually yeah. like a really hard weed out class and then find that yeah. you know it just it just paves the way to a great career so then you graduated from university of michigan and you got your first job at ibm big mm -hmm. blue big blue and i know a lot of people as they choose their careers, they have no idea what it's like to work at a big company versus working at a small company. And what was it like to work at a big technology company at the time? And were there any surprises, things that you would not have expected? So I didn't really know what to expect. I was obviously very young mm -hmm. and it was my first job. And IBM was the place to go. If you were in computer science, this is kind of way, you know, long, 25 80s, years ago, 80s, 80s yeah. yeah. Um, if you were in computer science, IBM was the place to go. So it was sort of a, a badge of honor to, yeah. to go work for IBM. So that was, so that was, you know, when I had the interviews and the job offers to me, that was, the, that was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And so I took it, came down to, went down to North Carolina, um, to take my first job in the lab and I was blown away just by the scale of IBM. I mean, it was a campus of maybe five or six buildings. They had everything from hardware manufacturing to software development to, um, you know, all kinds of departments and people that I had no idea. I didn't know that it took that much to create software. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the, the thing that, that blew me away at IBM. And I learned so much there. I learned a lot about the software development lifecycle. IBM was really good about having well-defined processes in place and 
um, educating people. I, I, I took a lot of classes mm -hmm. at IBM and learned more about IBM's technology and the way IBM works. And that helped me a ton later in life. It really set the groundwork for me for understanding how to build software end-to-end. -end. And mm -hmm. I was also really lucky. I was in a department that was, at the time, we were focused on a graphical user interface, which is kind of a new thing. It was sort of a mainframe world, mm -hmm. and we were the exciting new um, PC product that had graphics and everything, which was really neat. And so there was a lot of attention, and it was... So what we were doing was sort of on the edge, mm -hmm. like, like on the cutting edge of technology. And I also was lucky in the sense that I got a chance to participate where I really love, which was on the front side of the process. A lot mm -hmm. of times programmers, young programmers come in and they start testing, learn to love that, stay in that realm. I got lucky and started off in design, which is unusual, and just happened to be that that's where our project was. And that's where I really, that's what I really enjoy as well is that design, phase, development, all of that. So Awesome. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And so you were at IBM for how many years? I was at IBM for nine years. Okay. And there was kind of a progression, I would imagine, mm -hmm. through the, the company. I know a lot of young people going into a company have really no idea how long it takes to get maybe from one position to another. I've seen this over and over. Mm -hmm. You sort of think, that you know, a couple of years you're going to be in VPs and director roles, but then when you realize how big the company is, you realize the progression doesn't necessarily go like that. Anything that you can say about that kind of how the career progresses? And... I mean, I think it really depends on the company mm -hmm. that you work at. And at IBM, there were lots of layers of management, mm -hmm. probably too many. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that since that time, IBM has wiped out a number of those management layers. Um, the one thing that IBM did that was really interesting is they provided two different tracks. Mm -hmm. So if you were in a technology position, you could stay a individual contributor technologist for your entire career mm -hmm. and grow in a very prestigious path along the research realm. Mm -hmm. Or you could go into management if you liked that route and you could manage te people and build teams. And what I did, I was, um, I ended up, going into a, a team leadership position and then jumping around to different groups within IDM. And one of the groups that I worked in was a very entrepreneurial group that kind of owned everything. Mm -hmm. And that was a great experience too. So there was a just, I mean, IBM is kind of like its own world. It had a whole huge ecosystem of different types of departments and different mm -hmm. groups. Um, it was a great place to go for a first career mm -hmm. for me. Um, and now that, and then after IBM, I um, actually took a leave of absence for a couple of years while my husband went to England mm -hmm. and had my second daughter over there. Mm -hmm. So I had two young children, came back to the States after a couple of years, and that's when I went to work for Sony Ericsson. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of when I, I actually really loved Sony Ericsson too. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit different, totally different company, very hardware-centric, and I was on the software side, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, really, really cool. They were into mobile technologies, so everything at Ericsson was very cutting edge as well. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really exciting. But one of the things that I did get frustrated with, both at IBM and Sony Ericsson, was just how long it took to bring products to market, mm -hmm. how frustrating that was. It felt like, you know, that there were these bureaucratic decisions made to cut products that, you know, those of us working on those products really would have no idea why that was happening. So mm -hmm. I felt very removed from the business decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, um, I understood the technology inside and out, but I didn't understand the business aspects mm -hmm. of what, why the company was doing what they were doing. You know, mm -hmm. I had no insight into that. <clears throat> So Nasrin, as we were talking about some of your experiences in big technology companies, being on the technology side, sometimes you didn't have insight into some of the business decisions and how they were made. And so what happened then? It sounds like you went to business school. I did. So actually, um, I had some ideas mm -hmm. around some cool technology, and I had a, a couple of friends that were also interested in exploring technologies and potential business ideas. So mm -hmm. we talked about forming a company way back when we were working at, when I was at Sony Ericsson, and we were having conversations about what could we do on our own to get out of this environment but explore some of the technologies on our own. So we actually, I had those conversations about starting a company and 
building a company around technology, mobile technologies in particular, while um, in the Sony Ericsson environment, but I realized I didn't have any business experience. And so I actually went to business school to gain the business experience, which, which is interesting because a lot of my um, fellow students were there to make a career move, which mm -hmm. I guess I was, I was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to get into the small business arena. I wanted to start my own company. I thought the environment was right for it, that mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, opportunity out there for people to take technology and do things with it that weren't being done with any bigger companies. And that's kind of where I wanted to kind of take you back to that mm -hmm. decision point because for some reason I thought you went to business school and then you came up with the idea of starting your own business, but it sounds like the seeds were planted at Ericsson were. kind of when you were in the environment. And, and was it because that long product cycle that you mentioned earlier because that was getting frustrating or some of the business decisions? Were? I think part of it was that the technology development and, and bringing it to market a lot of times didn't happen mm -hmm. and it got stalled and you know we would sit there and think this is a great product and why are we you know there's so much bureaucracy around getting it to market and there's a huge opportunity on there we could do better mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I mean it, kind of that that same thing we had felt like we had a lot of, and this is, you know, this was kind of before I went to business school, it was just, the idea was already forming that this environment, this corporate environment is too slow for me. Mm -hmm. It's too slow, it's too methodical, um, it's not nimble enough, and I liked the idea, I, I didn't like a lot of the, the bureaucracy of mm -hmm. a big company, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the slowness of a big company, the, um, what appeared, what felt to me like, um, archaic decision making and and overburdened processes and things mm -hmm. and so I you know I, I I was I was interested at that point I'd been at IBM for nine years I've been to, with Sony Ericsson for a couple of years but I had a whole lot of experience in the big company environment and I thought I wanted to change and mm -hmm. work in a small company and then I thought why not start my own you know mm -hmm. why not why not uh, I love it exactly so, so so how did that get to get so you so were you already putting it together while you were getting your MBA or you took the time off to do the learning? How did all. how did Mobile Reach come together? So how Mobile Reach came together was interesting. So I we had those ideas and I just, um, so another piece of the puzzle actually is that I, while I was at IBM, I actually went to graduate school for computer science. Mm. And while I was at graduate school, I did a thesis on um, mobile computing. And I did this great project, um, and that's I think kind of where the seeds really started was that I had developed this pretty cool technology um, at at um, Duke Graduate School mm -hmm. while I was at IBM, and then um, I took a leave of absence. Then I went to to Sony Ericsson to kind of expand my knowledge around mobile computing and where it was. And so that's sort of where the seeds planted on. I have this great idea. I think I can turn this into a business. Mm -hmm. But then I got, then I sort of chickened out because I didn't have the business experience. The guy that I was talking with, a friend of mine, he kind of backed out. He's like, ah, oh, this is a little, you know, I'm not sure what, how to, what to do. And so I decided to go to business school. Mm -hmm. I did. I went to business school for a couple of years. And then when I graduated, and while I was at business school, I took entrepreneurship classes. I did an um, internship at a venture capital firm to learn more about entrepreneurship. And, and that was all kind of building on that foundation of I really want to be start my own company. Mm -hmm. And then when I graduated, I was actually introduced to a company, Mobile Reach. It was called Mobile Reach Technologies at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was a couple of other folks had started that company built some technology out that was very similar to what I had envisioned when I was at business school mm -hmm. and sort of what had been percolating in my mind for the last, you know, couple of years. And so I actually joined their company mm -hmm. and we were, we, I worked for them for a couple of years and then the company transitioned. There was a little bit of a fallout mm -hmm. amongst the management team. And then some of the folks that I worked with at that company decided to adopt the technology and form our own company and so we created this a license arrangement with the prior company and so we formed our company in 2006 mm -hmm. as sort of a, an outshoot of the original company where the mm -hmm. technology was originally built uh, mobile reach technologies we turned our company into mobile reach mm -hmm. um, officially spectrum mobile incorporated and we used the the name and do businesses mobile reach still 
Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So now here you are, mm -hmm. you're running a business. And I guess one of the questions is you started it, but it was already started. So I was going to ask you, how do we get off the ground? How do we get, how do we get off the ground or, or how you found maybe your first customers? But maybe before I ask you that, what I'd like to ask you is what's exciting about this technology? Well, the technology itself is really exciting to me because it's all about, so our customers are other companies, they're mm -hmm. big companies mm -hmm. that have, that have mobile workers. And the things that are super exciting about our technology to me are, first of all, that it makes other companies better. Mm -hmm. it, it allows us to give them a tool to make their business better, what, you know, in, in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And the, the technology is very flexible. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can go in there and we can talk with a customer about their business needs and bring in our technology to help them basically um, allow their field force to become more effective and more efficient. Mm -hmm. So, which makes their business more competitive. Mm -hmm. And so we have a variety of different cu customers and a variety of d different businesses that all use our technology for similar purposes, but it makes them all competitive in their own space. So that's... So Nasrin, you're a woman in a field that's traditionally male technology. You're also a business owner in a traditionally male industry. Mm -hmm. Have there been challenges related to that, or have there been interesting experiences or differences between men and women that you've noticed? I think so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing for me is really um, being in the computer science field at mm -hmm. school. Sometimes I was literally one of two or three women in a class of 100, 150. <laughs> That's amazing to me. Yeah, I mean, and so it's sort of been that way. I'm, ve I mean, I'm very used to walking into a business meeting and being the only woman. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how it was frequently at business meetings that I attended earlier in my career. It's not so much now. Now there's a lot more women in the field, obviously, but sort of I, I grew up in, in being in environments that were very male dominated. And one of the things that I actually like about it, and I think this is a personality thing is, um, I really liked being the center of attention and the fact that, that people didn't forget me. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd, I'd be in a meeting with all men and, and people would remember me simply because I was female. I would stand out. And I like that because overall, I, and I think here's, here's one of the differences between men and women, I'm generally more soft-spoken, quiet, you know, I'm the kind of person and leader actually that will sit back and take in information. I think a lot of women are like this. This is mm -hmm. some of the challenges between women and men in leadership positions is that, and it's, it, it's kind of sort of common knowledge in a way that, that men are a lot more assertive. Men will, will be a lot more confident with less information, whereas mm -hmm. women, you know, need a lot more information to be as confident mm -hmm. in, in kind of standing up and stating their opinion. So I think there's, I really, really appreciate the male approach and the female approach. And Sometimes I love working with men just because we're different. Mm -hmm. So a man, you know, if I'm working with a man, um, you know, I know he's going to be more typically, not always, he's typically going to be a lot more confident, energetic, ready to go mm -hmm. with less information where I'm going to be a little bit more cautious and are we sure this is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. So we balance each other out really well. And I think a very, in, in healthy environments, men and women make a really powerful combination. Mm -hmm. um, where it does get challenging is where I'm not necessarily seen as of seen as as strong of a leader because mm -hmm. I'm not as initially assertive or aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned before, I'm the type of person that likes to soak in information before making a decision. Mm -hmm. I'm a very open-minded person in general. Mm -hmm. So I like trying to look at things from different angles. I like seeing different people's perspectives. Um, so I think in a lot of ways that that's just how I am. Mm -hmm. And that, and I'm not, every woman is not the same way, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of women do tend to be less assertive, but also more global in their approach. Mm -hmm. So women tend to be, think about more aspects of a, of a situation before coming to a decision mm -hmm. or a solution and um, men tend to be a little bit more impulsive, mm -hmm. ready to, to go, you know, very strong, um, 
powerful type leaders, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the right word is, but more focused too, I, mm -hmm. I noticed. It's interesting mm -hmm. that you mentioned this because you know I run groups right. and sometimes I'll have all women in the group, sometimes I'll have all men, but the groups that traditionally have been the funnest have been the ones that have been integrated with women and men. And often when we've tackled a business issue, I've seen the same things. Mm -hmm. So men will come from a completely different place than women. But what's interesting is that those different perspectives or ways of looking at it are surprising in a positive way for both genders. Yes, if they're open to it. And if they're open to it, but most yeah. people are. Most people are, yeah. yeah. I mean, there have I have been in situations <clears throat> where... I wouldn't say that I've necessarily been discriminated against, but <clears throat> maybe my opinions were discounted. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in a lot of it's cultural too. I think in some different cultures, and I work in a global industry with a lot of international, and I have my whole career really worked with a lot of other business people in different, different um, with in different cultures, different um, countries. And sometimes cultural differences, men and women are looked upon differently as mm -hmm. well. And so that, that has an effect too. But I totally agree with you. My, the best business interactions that I've had uh, or groups that I've worked in have been a combination of women and men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the, you get the best of both worlds, yeah. really. And then the men probably bring the women up to a, a place of more assertiveness, mm -hmm. whereas the women help the men sort of expand their thinking and maybe see more sides. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's so, a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah, excellent. So let's sort of move from gender to leadership. So okay. you've been a leader now for several years. Mm -hmm. Looking back, what are a couple of leadership lessons that you can maybe share with our viewers? Sure. Um, I think one of the most important things that I've learned over my career, and particularly with Mobile Reach and and you know growing that company and continuing to grow it in different ways, is just. <laughs> I mean, talking about women and men, it's not just women and men, but just people in general, mm -hmm. how important the people factor is. Mm -hmm. It's so important, so, so important to get the right people in the right positions, with, understand what the right positions are in your company. Mm -hmm. That's it's a, it's seems so easy and it is so hard. And mm -hmm. part of, you know, and part of this is my own challenge. You know, I'm a technologist, so... I understand technology and I think, okay, if I build this great technology, people are going to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, that's not really true. You have mm -hmm. to market it. Mm -hmm. You have to get out there and sell. That's all about building relationships with people, mm -hmm. buyers and sellers. And then you have to have a team in order to be a productive company. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of different people that have to work together. Mm -hmm. And having them all rally around a common goal mm -hmm. and, you know, get excited about the same thing and not have everybody running in different directions. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It's taken me a long time to learn that. And I, I kick myself on, of course, it, it, it needs to happen. But it's, it's very, very difficult. So what I'm continuing to learn as a leader and what I what I um, really enjoy getting out of the Aspire sessions mm -hmm. and other leadership groups that I work on is, is just learning how to do that better. Mm -hmm. Learning how to better understand people, um, motivate people, um, really build a team that's going to be effective together. No matter what business you're in, no matter how big or small your company is, I think that is the key. And mm -hmm. it's honestly, it's taken me a long time to really understand how important that is. Well, you know, those are really hard challenges. And I guess this is a great time to transition into you have worked with Aspire on mm -hmm. and off for several yeah. years. Yeah. Um, what value... Is, and, and also other coaching groups, mm -hmm. what value it, has it been to you as a business owner in your leadership to have this kind of support and guidance available? Maybe what stands out to you? So the thing that, that stands out to me about leadership groups in general is just getting perspectives from others mm -hmm. and you know, kind of learning from other people's experiences and um, having them challenge me mm -hmm. on my perspectives and my observations. And allowing me to challenge them on theirs. It's a great learning experience all around. Mm -hmm. I would say particularly with Aspire that I don't get with, uh, well I do get to a certain extent with other organizations but more with Aspire mm -hmm. is really self-knowledge, like mm -hmm. learning more about myself. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of growth in understanding my own motivations, my own strengths and weaknesses, and 
how I come off to others, mm -hmm. you know, whereas, whereas, um, other groups are, are, are focused. I'm also a member of Vistage mm -hmm. and this, that's a great, great group too. Lots of great skills. I think with Expire, it's, it's more reflective, mm -hmm. more kind of, um, reflecting on my own experiences and where I've been successful and where I haven't been successful and analyzing that so I can understand where my own strengths and weaknesses are and how mm -hmm. to kind of fix those or take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. So this wraps up this segment of my interview with Nasrin, where she talked about her journey and her career. But I also have two other video segments that I did with Nasrin. In one of them, she dives much more deeply into mobile reach and she talks about the business and the technology and what makes the technology so different and innovative compared to their competitors. And I think that's a very interesting video as well. And then there's a second, a third video where Nasrin talks a little bit about coaching and how coaching has really helped her in her leadership positions and also in running her business. So hopefully you'll also listen to those two videos and so long for now.